Welcome to KJV Cafe. Thanks for taking time out of your day to listen. Each episode of the cafe is dedicated to studying the Bible verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation. Your host here at the cafe is Bible teacher Clark Covington. Looks like the coffee is hot and ready, so let's get started. Amen. Glory to God. Welcome to the program. Welcome to the cafe. This is Pastor Clark Covington here with another episode of KJV Cafe. Amen. It is uh, a wonderful day here at the cafe as we get into God's word. Amen. We're going uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse through God's word here. What better way to spend the day? And we're doing it in bite-sized nuggets. Amen. Just a few verses really at a time. I believe that is the best way to study scripture. And the reason why is if we go faster than that, oftentimes we'll miss a lot. Um, And it's kind of like, you know, if you uh, ever have to check a box before signing up for something online or or paperwork, and what do you do? You just kind of like, I'll skim through this or I'll just check the box. Well, you miss everything, right? The same is with the Bible. I mean, if you know, and by the way, you could be held accountable for that, which is kind of scary. Uh, I know myself, you know, the sign here, you know, I just sign it and I'm like, well, I wonder what I just signed, you know, (laughs) but um, with the Bible, if we don't take our time, we're going to miss so much. Uh, So we're in Genesis seven, amen. And as God would have it in Genesis seven, that's the Lord's number for completion. God's perfect number. God's perfect will is about to happen and he's going to save man, though he's not going to save much of man, right? And so we're in Genesis 7, and what I'll do is I'll read the first um, five verses, and then we'll get to our uh, focus verse here in Genesis 7, verse 6. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah, this is verse six here, And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. Okay, so what we're seeing, to paint a picture, Noah is 600, amen. I mean, I'm, at the time of this recording, uh, getting near the mid-40s here, amen. 44, time of this recording. (laughs) I can't even, I mean, I've got young kids, a lot going on, but it would be hard to imagine 54, 64, 84. I can't imagine 600, but Noah's 600, and the time has come that God is going to flood the earth. And all of the building of the ark, even though that just takes place in a chapter or two in Genesis, really took what we believe to be roughly 100 years. And so after 100 years of building, after countless people doubting, after... Wondering, I'm sure, many days himself, what is going on, right? Because he's human. He's not perfect. Now God says it's the time. Genesis 7 starts with, and the Lord said. And we know when the Lord speaks, that's a done deal, my friend. It's going to happen. So we see Noah is 600 years old. And six, of course, being the number of man. Amen. And this is the time for judgment to come upon man. And as soon as we come back from this break, we're going to look a little bit deeper at what that judgment is. So stay tuned. You're listening to KJV Cafe. We encourage you to look us up on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Now let's get back to some more in-depth Bible study. So the other day I was doing a task for work and I had to... um, I didn't have to, but I decided to watch a, a, a online course, uh, well, part of it, for a um, uh, task that, that they, you know, kind of want me to do for work, okay? And so, you know, I, I'm the one that came to this page. I'm looking through this thing, and, I, and this person seems very reputable at a major university, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm watching this video, and I kid you not, I watched this video uh, for, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour 
took a break, come back to it. And I said, something is off here. And the professor had changed their name or, or gave themselves a name that was hard to decipher whether they were male or female. They looked, they had looked male. I thought it was a guy, but something just seemed off in the facial feature or something. And the more that I thought about it, it just kind of came upon me. I look, I'm slow here sometimes. It was actually a woman that had turned themselves into a man in every possible way. It was doing their level best to portray that in the, in this course. Uh, the course was about something with computers and nothing to do with gender identity, which is a fallacy. God gave us our gen gender. Our gender is either male or female. And I love it. Sometimes on the surveys, you'll say, okay, you know, enough with all the thoughts. What were you at birth? What did the doctors call you? Okay. Well, yeah, we're either male or female. Okay. God created male and God created female. Amen. The point I'm getting at is this individual is celebrated in society so much so that their course is very prominent and Many people take their course and they, they have all of this worldly acclaim, okay? And they are living in rebellion to God. And we live in a time where that little anecdote probably doesn't surprise anybody. You know, I mean, this person is in front of many young people at a major university and, and uh, putting out, purporting an identity that God didn't give them and rebelling openly in front of God. And I'm not picking on that one person. That's one section of a larger society. I mean, turn on social media or pick up a, a newspaper or go to a business meeting in the C-suite, wherever you go, wickedness seems to prevail. Well, at the time of Noah, this in fact was the case. Wickedness was ever, everywhere. It was abject wickedness. And here's God's plan. And God allows time to unfold. God was patient with Noah and God was patient with his creation. That's why Genesis 7 tells us it had been 600 years. How old was Noah's dad at the flood? 182. Uh, he has Noah. This is Lamech. The flood hit 600 years later. We know that Lamech lived 777 years. So it was roughly five years after Noah's dad died. Okay. We're going to operate under the assumption that Noah's dad was righteous. His grandpa was Methuselah. That's the one that lived the longest ever, amen, at 969 years. Methuselah died the year of the flood. Some believe that as Methuselah died, there was a seven-day mourning period, and then the flood came. Now, whether that's it or not, we know the same year that the flood came by looking at the timeline in Genesis, Methuselah died that same year. So Noah's dad dies, Methuselah dies, Noah's great-grandpa, Enoch. Walked with the Lord 365 years and didn't taste death. He's only, he's only one of two that we know of that did not taste death in the Bible. Amen. We see a righteous line ending in Noah. We see this line ending in Noah. So God was patient. There were righteous people that, 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 that uh, were allowed to be uh, carried on to the Lord before the flood would hit. I mean, look. It's one thing to die of natural causes. It's one thing for God to just go ahead and take you because you're his friend, amen, as he did Enoch. It's a whole other thing to watch that water come down, roaring down from the sky, amen, roaring down, the, the, you know, the, 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 the broken uh, of floodgates opening. It's one thing to watch that in terror as you die. No righteous person would want to experience that. Nobody wants to experience that. But God says no righteous person will, okay? So we see this righteous line. We see these individuals uh, being taken by the Lord. And there's scripture on that, that, you know, sometimes we mourn the death of an individual. And God says in his word, do you not know uh, that I'm taking them home out of my mercy? And here is that verse. It's in the book of Isaiah, chapter 57, verse 1. The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart, and merciful men are taken away. None considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. That's a beautiful verse. In the times of the flood, we see the righteous being taken away, whether it's Noah's uh, great-grandpa uh, in Enoch or his grandpa in Methuselah or his father in Lamech. These folks that are living right for God are taken because the evil that is to come. And of course, Isaiah writing this post-flood, we see that it deals with those that God may take home today. You know, we don't understand the Lord's ways. And there could be someone that's sold out to God, that's living for God, 
and their life seems to be cut short, so to speak. And God could be just doing them a favor. I think of one brother uh, that was rock solid on doctrine and everything else uh, in a different uh, denomination. And the Lord took him home many years ago. And that denomination went far liberal. And what I mean by liberal is not politically liberal. I mean liberal as in no longer holding the scripture as true, no longer living as God calls us to live, no longer standing on the old time way, not o- no longer seeking the old paths. And this brother, I believe, the Lord took him home so he didn't have to deal with that. Amen. He was high up in that denomination and that would have just been grievous for him to deal with. So we see here in Isaiah 57, 1, a great truth that God is merciful and we also see by Noah's age that God is very patient. I mean, if, if the world was so wicked at Noah's time, then for those 600 years, God had to put up with a lot of wickedness. And many people probably thought they were getting away with it. They probably were laughing. They were probably boastful. Like that professor who was literally fooling people. I mean, I mean like fooling people with their identity, but no one is fooling God. And it got so wicked and so bad that there are only eight righteous people left on earth. Only eight. Amen. Think about that. With all of the millions, I believe billions of people living at that time, Noah and his wife and his kids and their wives were the only ones found righteous on all the earth. And the popular scripture to compare this to would be when Abraham is going back and forth uh, with God Almighty about Will you burn down Sodom if there's one righteous there? Abraham was concerned about his nephew Lot. He didn't want Sodom burnt down. Lot was there. And God's like, I'm not going to burn it down if there's any righteous there. God is merciful. If there was someone else living righteous, I've said this before, I believe if there was someone else living righteous on all planet Earth, the Lord would have told them to hop on one of these animals and the animal would have taken them to Noah's Ark. They would have got on the Ark And it wouldn't have been the same narrative as just Noah being righteous. God's not a respecter of persons. God didn't need to just like turn Noah into somebody that was this great man of faith. Amen. God is willing to allow that narrative to be a little different, that it was Noah plus this person or this family or Noah and these three families. You know, God is righteous. Amen. When you read God's word, it is perfect. And part of what makes it perfect is it's so unusual. It doesn't follow like this, the plot that you would think like, in a plot that made like the hero the hero, uh, like King David, amen, you wouldn't have King David committing adultery, not going off to battle with his troops, killing his good friend, amen. Uh, you know, you wouldn't have that in, 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 in uh, like a story. You wouldn't write that character to fall into sin like that, amen. Uh, and then be so weak that he's calling on God, his bones are crying out, you know, that he's going to die. You know, you, you t- I know that you have melodramas and I know that you have problems pop up in stories and so forth, but the Bible is just so unusual. I think if King Hezekiah was righteous before God, he, his enemies, he spreads that letter out before God and God literally wipes out his enemies. And then he begs God for 15 more years. And what does he do? He shows the Babylonians his treasure. And God's like, you shouldn't have done that. You're going to get invaded and everything's going to get taken away, you know, but it won't happen in your lifetime. And Hezekiah's like, okay, good. Thank you. Lord, you're good. You know, it's again, these these are not the ways that that movies typically would end or books would typically end, but it's God's way. And, And that's why I truly believe that it literally was that one family found righteous. Amen. That one family. And I know afterwards some weird stuff happens and this and that. I'm not saying they were perfect. I'm saying they were righteous. And I'm also indicating that while, and we'll get to this in a little bit, but while the kids, you can say what you want about the kids, they were on that boat. It wasn't like they walked off the boat. You can remember again in our parallel comparison, what did you had? You had lots sons-in-law, okay? You had lots of uh, daughters, husbands to be that were what laughing at him, think mocking him, and they did not follow him out, and they they perished. So we see that in general, these eight believed. In general, these eight were found righteous, and these eight survived. Amen. God doesn't judge us on our perfection. God simply looks at our faith. Do we believe him to get on the ark? Back then, it was a literal ark, and now it is the ark of Jesus Christ. We believe on Christ as Savior, and we're born again. It's as simple as that. Nothing more to it. All right. Well, we'll get deeper into Genesis 7. We come back next time. Thank you for listening. Take care. God bless and amen. Thanks for spending time with us today at the cafe. We would love to hear from you. 
You can email Brother Clark directly at clark at enduringpromise.org. See you again tomorrow, same time, same place.